I remember Mr. Abbott. He was in his late 60s when he started teaching us math. Small eyes behind thick framed tortoise shell glasses and a once square jaw beginning to sag with time. He always wore a Lions Club baseball cap and I remember being disappointed when he told us they didn't train Lions there anymore. I was in grade 3 at the time. Our school didn't have a lot of money for extra staff, so volunteers from around our small town would come in to help us supply teachers. This meant that the same people would watch us at lunchtime from kindergarten to grade 8. It also had the side effect of meaning that a lot of people working there were pretty old. Mr. Abbott never felt old, even though he walked with a hunch some days. He would crack jokes about how grumpy Principal Joyce was, and seemed to always have a story for us before class. He was practically part of the school, visiting our classrooms, cheering at our pep rallies. One time, I remember he came into the room before lunch was even over, and started talking to us about some local kid who'd been arrested, and he said we should never throw away our lives like that. I couldn't tell you what the kid had done or even who he was, but it sure got Mr. Abbott fired up. Point is, he cared about us. Even then, I could feel that. The sun had already set by the time we reached the fire pit. We'd been out late that day for archery, and it being our last day at the camp, no one wanted to go back to their parents' farms or cul-de-sacs just yet. By this point in our trip, we'd settled into a routine. We'd all return from the day's activities, and our counselors and teachers would have dinner with us in the mess hall. After a meal of fried everything, we would hike out to a hill overlooking a lake and sit down around a fire pit where Mr. Abbott would tell us a story and talk about what we'd been up to that day. We got there later than usual to find him sat, adjusting his ball cap, and taking a big drink from a plastic water bottle. Hey there, whippersnappers, he said. I hear you've all been terrorizing the deer again. He said that like we'd all come into town after a long day working the fields. Like, come take a load off, son. I don't remember how the conversation turned from archery and canoeing to horror stories. Maybe it was Curtis who brought it up? But once he got on that trail, there was no getting him off. Sure, I've got one. It scared the daylights out of me when I was your age. It went like this. As a boy, Mr. Abbott lived with his mom in a post-war cottage, not too dissimilar from the ones across the street from our school. Money was tight for them, and she gave him five quarters to buy liver for supper. He set out for the butchers on his bike, but when he passed by the park, he saw all the neighborhood kids playing baseball. Now he never got a chance to go anywhere without his mother keeping a close eye on him, and he sure never got to play baseball, so he dropped his bike in the grass and went over to the oldest boy there. That boy told him he could play, so long as he paid them whatever money he had on him. Mr. Abbott said he wasn't even worried. He didn't think twice before he gave up the quarters and dashed over to home plate. I don't remember if he said he played well, maybe the kids hated him. But I do remember what the oldest boy said when he asked where he could find another liver. Patterson Yard just had a fresh one buried. I could loan you a shovel if you need it. His mother was so overjoyed to see the liver that she forgot how late he was getting home. He ate and went to bed right after, hoping the bubbling in his stomach wouldn't boil over before morning. He was awoken to a dark bedroom as something outside tripped past the moonlight of his window. I found your house and I want my back. He was too scared to try and peek through the window, instead holding his blankets close as he heard the shuffling move toward his door. With a click, the door opened, and again he heard, I'm inside now and I want my liver back. He pulled the covers up over his head as the footsteps moved down the hall, Every thump, 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 bringing the voice closer to him. I'm outside your room, and I want my liver back. He ducked under the covers just as the doorknob turned, thankful for the mound of blankets his mother insisted on keeping on his bed all year, in case a chill ever came creeping in. I'm peeling back the cover, and I want my liver back. He felt the heavy wool cover slide away and could just make out the shape of a man through the sheets. I'm peeling back the first sheet and I want my liver back. 
He was paralyzed to act, the first sheet lifting away as the corpse's cracked skin and tattered suit came into sharp focus. At this point, Mr. Abbott leaned forward towards us. I've found you, and I'll take my liver back. He jumped, screaming the last word and surprising all of us who sat close by. Some of the kids yelped, others giggled. I sat stunned. But most of the guys just thought it was lame. When Curtis asked everyone about it, Jake said Mr. Abbott was full of shit, Eric and Ryan quickly agreeing. I was so tired that rather than telling them I actually liked the story, I just climbed into my sleeping bag and tried my best to ignore them. Our cabin was the smallest on site. Where the others had bedrooms and bathrooms with showers, ours had an interior wall dividing the two rooms. We had bunk beds with thin frames that shook the chipboard walls when you jumped off the top bunk, and only the back room had windows. One of said windows provided a scenic view of the outhouse, while the other was partially blocked by Curtis's bed. I'm not sure which view I disliked more. Curtis and I didn't play football at lunch, we had never seen the Rocky movies, and we were too chicken of Miss Lawrence to sneak out of the cabin that night, so we had been relegated to the back room. I had just begun to fall asleep when a shrill whisper broke the silence. Wake up. I know you aren't sleeping. I've always had this thing about not sleeping in a bright room, and the moonlight was causing Curtis's shadow to stretch across the cabin, his every toss and turn tripping the light and keeping me awake. Yeah? What do you want? Shh. He is. What do you mean, shh? There's someone outside. Be quiet. It's probably just Eric. No. No, no, no. He's taller than Eric. Whoever they are, they're just stumbling around. I think they're hurt. I got out of bed at that last part, pushing past Curtis to peek through the window. In the moonlight, I could see to the tree line. At first, I couldn't tell them from the branches, but as I stared at the window, a shape seemed to move through them. Hunched. Stumbling. They looked hurt. Tripping over brush, clutching at their stomach. They were taller than Eric. I, I tried to match them with any of the teachers on the trip, no one I could think of was that thin. I told Curtis we had to help, but he just stared forward and shook his head. I'm not sure how long we watched them for. I think we were both too scared of the thin-armed silhouette to look away. What if they crept closer? What if they banged on the glass and opened the door? What if they crept inside? Our cabin was so far off the trail, no one could reach us before... So we sat transfixed as they shambled in the moonlight. It was like it was faking sluggishness, like it took effort to be that slow. I remember Curtis asked if it looked like it had any bones, before their heads suddenly snapped up and they pranced off deeper into the trees. It was like watching a gazelle in one of those nature documentaries, right when the herd notices a lion. They craned their neck up out of the brush and just bounded off. Eric and Ryan came bolting through the door shaking the whole cabin, causing me to yelp. They'd lost track of Jake, and they were chased back to our cabin. By a raccoon. The guys could tell Curtis and I were freaked out, and when they saw that we were in the same bunk together, let's just say the rumors that followed were pretty cruel. Our class left the campsite the next morning, loading onto the bus as the sun was rising. Jake was there. He looked tired. I don't remember if he was talking to anyone. <laughs> I only remember one conversation with him before his family moved away that fall. I asked Jake what happened that night. He said he was visiting the girls' cabin so he could see Haley. They, they were dating at the time. And Miss Lawrence walked in. <laughs> he had to hide under the bed. She wouldn't leave, so he was stuck there till everyone fell asleep and he could sneak out. I don't know if I believe him. He was always trying to make himself sound cool like that. <laughs>